Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Majority Leader Jamie Long and excited to be here today to talk about the Minnesota Care Public Option. So we know that too many Minnesotans still don't have access to affordable health care coverage. And in Minnesota, we believe that everyone deserves access to health care, no matter our race, income, age, zip code, or employment status. So the bill that we're talking about today aims to solve three problems. The first is that a lot of individuals don't have affordable health insurance uh, options for them. And this often includes those who are self-employed or essential workers who are juggling multiple jobs. Uh, I know that in my community, when I'm talking to folks, people share, share their personal health stories with us all the time. Uh, and those are often some of the hardest conversations we have. And the most common conversation that I have is not that people don't uh, trust that they can get access to a good doctor is that they don't think they can afford it. And they struggle with having the ab ability uh, to know that they can get the care they need and still be able to pay their bills. And that means that oftentimes people are locked into jobs uh, that they feel like they can't escape for the health care, uh, or um, they have to avoid seeking care because they're not worried that they're worried that they're not going to be able to pay for it. We also know that a lot of our small business owners uh, can't provide the options that they want for their own employees uh, to have affordable health care. I've talked to small business owners in my district who self-insure, who try to cover all their employees, and that puts them at a large risk uh, if one of their employees gets sick, that they're not going to be able to cover those costs. And I had one employer who nearly went out of business because they were trying very hard to cover the cost for one of their employees. We also are providing coverage to undocumented Minnesotans, and we know that undocumented Minnesotans right now often are only able to seek emergency health care uh, and are waiting until the uh, things get really bad, which is not what we want to uh, provide for our health care system. We need coverage that uh, helps everybody. Minnesota Care has been a successful public health care program in our state since 1992. It was passed on a bipartisan basis. It's a national leading health care program. And what we're proposing is letting folks buy in to this national leading program. This bill will lead to reductions in uninsurance, in underinsurance, and in uncompensated care. And it is time that we finally provide affordable health care to all Minnesotans. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mary France with the Rural Organizing Project. Hello, I'm Mary Franz. I'm a wife and mother of two young, adorable children. I'm a leader in the Rural Organizing Project of Isaiah, Minnesota. I'm fortunate enough to be the second generation to farm on my small family farm in southern Minnesota. Before going to back to work on my family farm, I worked in the service and retail industries, in both cases for small local businesses that could not provide health insurance. Passing this bill is very important to me. I think about health care on a regular basis. I do some business with some Canadian farmers. One day I called one of them and they told me they had to take their husband to the ER for a bloody nose. I told her I could never imagine going to the ER for something small like a bloody nose. It would have to be something major and I would be terrified of what it would cost my family. In December of 2018, my husband and I were excited enough we're excited to bring our son into the world. Even with a routine birth and only two nights in the hospital, we met our high deductible. Since it was late in the year, we weren't billed until 2019. We had saved as much as we could that year prior to having our son to make sure we could cover our large out-of-pocket amount. Then, in May of 2019, I had, emergency I had an emergency apodectomy. Just five months later, I had reached my individual deductible for that year. In the first half of 2019, we ended up paying 25% of our taxable income on routine medical. Instead of enjoying being a new family of three, we had to find a way to pay for our two pretty routine procedures. Our only option was to sell assets. We had to sell uh, a few cows that we weren't planning on selling. Expanding Minnesota care with a public option is a step in the right direction for health care reform in the state of Minnesota not just for my family and other farm families in the state trying to feed America, but also us small businesses and their employees. We shouldn't have to worry about if medical care is gonna bankrupt us. We should be thinking about how to grow our businesses and pass them on to the next generation. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Tavana Johnson. I'm a home care worker and a member of SEIU Healthcare Minnesota and Iowa. I'm here today to share a little bit of my life with you. My late husband owned a small business for more than 45 years of his life. During that time, with the exception of the last three years of his life, he was as healthy as a person could be. That all changed in August of 2020 when he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. After an emergency surgery to remove a blockage, the hospital scheduled chemotherapy to begin in 12 weeks. That was a very scary time. As a small business owner, my husband did not have good, health, good insurance options. Private health insurance plans for small businesses were incredibly expensive and unusually, with unusually high co-pays and deductibles that provided very little coverage. If this bill had been in law, a small business owner like my husband would have been able to buy into the Minnesota Care, the Minnesota Care Plan. He would have bought a good plan with good coverage and an, at an affordable price. Because my husband did not have that option and because he wanted to keep investing in his business, he decided just to pay out of pocket for any care or injuries that might require a doctor's visit. When he was diagnosed, the hospital told us that we needed to find coverage or be prepared to pay a $14,000 upfront cost for every chemotherapy treatment each time, which was every two weeks. That did not include the doctor's visits and blood tests. To say the least, it was incredibly challenging to get the insurance, get private insurance with a pre-existing condition outside of a regular enrollment process. We had to try to navigate a, very, a variety of private and public plans with confusing guidelines. Anybody else would have thrown up their hands and, and quit, but I couldn't. After lots of hard work, I was able to get him access to a private insurance plan through Minsure. The monthly premiums were astronomical, upwards of $1,300 a month, which was higher than the mortgage of our home. The, ducts, the deductibles were obscenely high and that did not include pres prescription drug costs or, 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 or co-pays. We had to drain his retirement fund just to, say, just to stay afloat, and we did that for a year. We had no choice. My husband had to have this life-saving treatment. I couldn't just let him die. Once again, if this bill would have been law, he would have, he would have had access to a more affordable public plan that could provide better coverage. The stress of all that was almost too much to bear, especially while sick. I can remember thinking, how much does a human life cost? And who put the price tag on that? We were lucky we had one another. My husband passed away just a little over a month ago. The money that he saved and planned to use for us to retire together is gone. We had to use it to cover those medical costs. The money intended for me to survive on after he was gone is no more. I can't say that I'm not struggling financially out here alone. I can only imagine what it could have looked like if we didn't have to make those choices that we did. We could 
We must ensure that everyone has access to good quality health care and that no one has to go through those things. That they don't have to lose everything that they have worked their entire lives for. Um, hello. Um, my name is Luke Breen. Uh, I'm a lifelong Minnesotan, grew up in West Central Minnesota, and now reside in South Minneapolis. Uh, currently, my wife and I own uh, Perennial Cycle, which is a bike shop in uptown Minneapolis. Uh, April will be our uh, 30th year in business. Uh, as small business owners, my wife and I are dealing with many challenges every day. Most of these challenges are challenges that we knew were coming when we made the choice to be self-employed. Some are bigger than others, um, and each day brings on a whole new set. Healthcare is one of those challenges that is just simply too, biz too huge for our small business to overcome. Um, it's normal for my own family's uh, insurance to have high deductible. So for 25 years, our deductibles have been between 10 and $14,000 a year. I'm just talking about my personal family. Um, up until Obamacare, that insurance did not even cover an annual physical. Um, it didn't cover anything until if we were unfortunate enough to hit the deductible. Uh, thanks to the Minsure Marketplace, we've been able to get the family covered in a more affordable way uh, and get more insurance. We still have extremely high deductibles, um, but the monthly out-of-pocket isn't as much. Um, the business that I own um, seems to fall into a crack that um, is just too small to be able to offer affordable health care to our employees. Um, and then my employees fall into a little bit deeper a crack in that they're earning a little too much to get Minnesota care. Um, and so they're in the situation where they're out um, searching for insurance through the health, th through the standard health plans. Um, this combination makes it really difficult for me to keep employees. Uh, over the years, I've lost several employees due to their aging out of their family's health care. This is always a sad thing to have happen, and yet it's just a reality um, for me. While I'd love to be able to cover their health insurance needs, it's not, it's not realistic, and I don't see it being realistic anytime in the near future. The Minnesota Care public option would be extremely beneficial to my business, and I believe it would be a huge asset for many small businesses like Perennial Cycle throughout the state that are struggling to keep employees as well as struggling to pay for their own family's health care. Thanks very much. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Perla Ramos. I am a community health organizer for Unidos Minnesota and Fair and Justice in Central Minnesota. Unidos Minnesota is an immigrant-led statewide organization building power for Minnesota working families to advance social, racial, and economic justice. Today, I am speaking in favor of HF96 because Unidos Minnesota believes in healthcare for all. We know that healthcare is not affordable for many citizens, including, including higher, higher wages uh, workers who have expensive insurance. And we also support the Minnesota healthcare public option that will, that will allow more people to buy in into the Minnesota care. The public option HF96 is the building block we need to move to, towards universal coverage. Four years ago, I became aware of a serious need for affordable health care in central Minnesota. 
especially after I learned about a community member experiencing near death situations due to a lack of routine care. This lack of care led me to get involved with Fe and Justice leaders to help organize a free medical clinic to provide access to healthcare. Our free clinic has served more than 300 patients in the last year with the help of Central Minnesota doctors and nurses who volunteer monthly. We have, many, we have seen many people with chronic conditions in need, in need of more specialized attention which, which we are unable to provide due to limited resources. Our goal is to make sure our community has access to health insurance at low cost, high quality, so they can have a better healthy life with their families. By passing this bill, they will be able to see a doctor on a regular basis and prevent, and prevent future illness and high expenses. <laughs> Because healthcare is very expensive for insurance folks, many don't go back to follow up with doctor's appointments, which has led to serious outcomes. We support HF96 because our work and our volunteer clinic is not enough. People without insurance need consist, consistent, affordable healthcare coverage. This is why we urge urge uh, legislators to pass HF96, a bill that, uh, that will provide health insurance to keep our most vulnerable families healthy and strong. Thank you. Hello. I am, thank you for asking me to speak. I am Dr. Catherine Guthrie. Uh, leader with Isaiah Faith in Minnesota, and also a family physician who has practiced in Minnesota for 43 years. I've spent the first part of my career in two rural communities, uh, very small communities, and for the last 29 years have been working with a safety net clinic in downtown St. Paul who both provides access to care and trains young family physicians. I have seen firsthand many examples of the consequences of under or uninsurance and strongly support access to Minnesota care increased through the public buy an option. The following three stories are real examples of the high cost of un or under insurance. People whose lives would have been radically changed had they had access to the type of care option in the proposed bill. First, a 40-year-old man found a lump in his testicle. He couldn't afford insurance, although he was employed because he made more than the $27,000 a year, which is the threshold for Minnesota Care buy-in currently. Because of fearing the bills, he delayed presenting to one of my partners to seek care. By the time he was able to get diagnosed with testicular cancer, it had spread all over his body. And despite efforts with expensive and then unsuccessful treatment, he died in his early 40s. A mother in her late 30s found a breast lump. Because she was undocumented, she delayed getting it checked. While a state screening program covered the cost of diagnosis of her breast cancer and emergency as assistance covered her initial surgery, she had no coverage and could not access any coverage for the long-term follow-up needed to manage a chronic illness like breast cancer. When she returned to care, her breast cancer had spread to her bones. It is, they can create a stalemate for her cancer, but she has young children at home and she will likely not survive. A self-employed friend was only able to get insurance with a very high deductible that she couldn't afford. She delayed testing for life-threatening sleep apnea until she developed heart failure. 
On behalf of the thousand Minnesotans who have similar stories, I urge you to pass this bill to expand the public buy-in option, including people who earn above the 200% federal poverty income guidelines, those who otherwise face unaffordable copays, and undocumented persons who contribute immensely to our state economy. No Minnesotan should have to pay for lack of affordable health care with their life or with their family's well-being. I firmly believe that passage of this bill is a step toward broader justice in health opportunities for all Minnesotans. We can and will do better. Thank you. Well, it's just such an honor to be here today with the advocates who uh, have worked so hard and, and are bravely sharing their story. Um, you've just heard from these advocates in clear and sometimes very heartbreaking terms why the Minnesota Care Public Option is needed. I'm really grateful, especially to Tavana. Uh, we're all so sorry for your loss. All Minnesotans deserve access to quality, affordable care. This is, um, you know, somebody asked, why do you seem so happy this year, right? This trifecta gives us the power to change people's lives, to dramatically impact people's lives, from restoring the vote to driver's licenses for all. But this, perhaps, is, is the most clear example of where public policy can intervene and make a meaningful difference in people's lives. We have the opportunity to provide this Minnesota Care public option. And in the current legislature, we are working to make this a reality. It really is a matter of life and death. And beyond uh, it being a matter of life and death, it's about the quality of life that Minnesotans experience. A public option will give Minnesotans across the board the option to pursue high quality care. It will build on this proven model that was a wonderful breakthrough in 1992 of Democrats and Republicans working together. And we'll be able to provide that health care at a price that people can afford. For more than 30 years, Minnesota Care has been making a difference in people's lives, and we know we can now expand that to more people. A broad group of stakeholders has been working to create this Minnesota Care public option since 2016, and here we are in 2023, and we can make it happen. We absolutely need to make sure that every Minnesotan can afford their health insurance premiums and actually get the care that they need. Thousands struggle with insurance that they cannot afford, either because of high deductibles or high co-pays or all the other expenses that you've heard about that go with getting health care for a loved one. But this doesn't need to be the case in Minnesota. We don't need to be dependent on employer-provided, you know, large employer-provided um, health care plans. We can provide another option. So many Minnesotans right now who have employer-based health care don't change their job and they don't start small businesses because they're concerned about losing their health care. And we have un, uh, inexcusable racial disparities in Minnesota in so many different ways and access to health care is one of the areas where we have inexcusable um, racial disparities. So with the Minnesota Care Public Option, we can really do something about the disparities that we currently have in care for Minnesotans. I want to thank the Majority Leader for his courage to step up and carry this bill. Um, the Governor just signed his 100% clean energy bill uh, into law yesterday, and I said he better get used to having the Governor sign his bills into law. <laughs> um, this is going to be a lot of work to get through the whole system and bring it uh, uh, to the Governor's desk, but I think we know we've got a capable ball carrier here who can bring this uh, into, the, into the end zone. So uh, thank you for everyone who has worked so hard so far. This is government of the people, by the people, for the people, only when the people are part of the enterprise here at the state capitol. And so I want to thank you for you doing your part to bring this proposal to the legislature. And now we'll do our part, and we'll get it passed. And with that, I think uh, we'll take questions. Can I ask the sponsor to Can you give us some numbers here? Is there a state cost? Is there an appropriation needed? Does it do anything with uh, provider reimbursement rates, which has been an issue in expanding in the past? And how many people do you think uh, might be uh, interested in coming on to this coverage? Sure. Well, I think in, uh, in terms of interest, I think you've heard a lot of interest here today. We certainly are 
uh, meeting a lot of needs, and those needs are from small business owners, those needs are from individuals, those needs are from undocumented Minnesotans. I don't have a specific number of how many folks would seek to uh, use the Minnesota Care Buy-in, um, the public option, but I think it would be uh, many in our state. In terms of the cost, uh, there was a, um, we have a proposal from the governor that was in his budget. We have the proposal that we have before us today. We don't have a current fiscal note for the bill that we are taking up in committee today. Uh, but we're going to be working together with the governor, with the public, to try to make sure that this is a workable bill, that it is meeting our goals of providing affordable health care uh, coverage to Minnesotans. And so I think that the cost discussions will continue. But I will say that a lot of this cost is not going to be a public cost. We are giving an option for folks who are above 200% uh, of the federal uh, poverty line to buy in. So there will be premiums that will be paid by individuals to help uh, purchase Minnesota care. And we also know that there will be uh, assistance from the federal government and assistance from state programs that will be available as well. So it's combining all of those different financial pools uh, to make this a workable and affordable system for everybody. There is no, there, there won't be a cap. Uh, so anybody would be able to buy into uh, any income level. That's correct. It would, that's right. It would, there would be a sliding, uh, a sliding fee that will be uh, worked out uh, with the agencies. It's, there's not a current proposal in the bill for what that would look like, but it would put it to the agencies to develop a sliding scale. Just kind of say where they are now, because don't provider fees pay into this? Uh, the bill as proposed doesn't currently change uh, provider fees. I'm sure that's going to be an active, active discussion. I know that there's, uh, um, if we're expanding the level of coverage, I'm sure there's going to be interest in making sure that uh, we have affordable options for everyone, and that will be a discussion we have. Is there discussion at all about a single payer, full single payer option, or is this sort of a first step towards something like that, or is this kind of a program that Democrats want to see? Well, so I think when uh, when we passed the Affordable Care Act, uh, the the big, big business that was left undone at that time was a public option. That was uh, a big point of disagreement between um, even Democrats at that time and Congress to try to get this done. And so that's really fallen to the states to try to have that conversation and see if we can make sure that there is an affordable option that is a public plan uh, that folks can buy into. So that's the step we're trying to take today. There uh, is a lot of interest from many of our members in, in moving towards a single payer, but that's not what this bill does. Is there a companion bill being introduced in the Senate? Do you have a timeline on when it might be introduced? Yes, uh, there is a companion bill. I think our, our uh, co-author couldn't make it today, but Senator Melissa Wickland, the chair of the Health Committee in the Senate, is our, our co-author in the Senate. How does this play with the insurance? Might it reduce the amount of um, state money that would have to go to reinsurance if the mix of policy buyers moves from the uh, individual market to something like this to change that? You know, I don't have a, a good answer for you. I'm not sure. I don't know if you have a... I think that's probably a question for, for Commissioner Grace Arnold, uh, the Commerce Commissioner. But, you know, reinsurance, that was to keep prices down in the purely private market. And so, yes, I could imagine there would be some people who would enter the Minnesota Care buy-in program. Uh, but exactly how those things would interplay and what the predictions would be about how many people who would move from the insure market into... Uh, Minnesota Care, those are really great questions that the Commerce Department will probably be asked to testify to uh, as this bill progresses through the process. Yes, time for one more question. This Sorry. is currently contracted out to health care companies or to insurance companies like Blue Cross or other, other providers actually issue the cards to the people in the system, right? Yeah, that's correct. So the current model is that we have um, public framework around what the insurance option must look like, and it is uh, provided currently by health insurance companies. We do have a study in the bill to look at whether there is a different delivery model that could provide that more effectively, um, but we need to gather a lot of information uh, about whether that would be a better option for Minnesotans, and so that's why at this point it's a study in the bill, and we're, we're keeping with the current uh, Minnesota care <coughs> provider model that we have right now. Marty model that you're talking about. The well, the John Marty model is a, a little different. That's a, a full a full single payer. Um, but the study would look at whether Minnesota Care uh, should have a different um, provider model, whether it should be a public uh, model, or if we uh, would benefit more from keeping the insurance provider model that we have right now. Can you talk about 
big of a priority this is. I mean, is this going to be included in budget conversations? Is this going to travel as a standalone? Um, and do you expect it to, to pass this year, so given how complex it is? It's a very high priority. So I would say that the Senate DFL, the House DFL, and the governor are united in our objective to make health care more affordable and accessible to Minnesotans. Uh, there's a very broad coalition of folks who've been working on this for many years, and we believe the Minnesota Care buy-in is one ingredient to making health care more affordable and accessible in Minnesota. So when, when I think of our health care priorities, uh, you know, the high cost of pharmaceutical drugs is an area where we have a lot of work going on. Uh, Representative Zach Stevenson is carrying legislation in that area. But this is the piece that kind of gets at health care more broadly, and so is a, a top priority of the caucus. Thanks, that's all we have time for. Thank you all. Here at 1 p.m.